So a few months ago when I saw this conference, I thought, oh, it's cool. It's a good chance to show off what I've been working on. I've been building a Memex. Um, but then in the intervening months, I think I've, I've grown depressed about some of the news I've been reading. Um, so it's going to be a slightly different talk. It's uh, still roughly what I've been working on, but with a different context. Um, <laughs> but before we get into uh, sort of this project and climate change, I'm going to go back, back in history and talk about some, some ancient history first. Um, has any, does anybody know about the Sea Peoples? Are there any history people in the room? So these were a Bronze Age, a Bronze Age group. They just appeared out of nowhere um, on boats around the Mediterranean, and they started sacking city after city. Um, we don't know who, who they were or what they were up to, but we know that they destroyed a bunch of cities. Uh, this is one in northern Syria. Um, archaeologists can dig down and see the layer of destruction that the Sea Peoples caused. Um, this, is, this is the last king of, the, of, the, of this empire um, saying that the enemy ships burned down the city. Uh, and we have records like this from a lot of other places. So uh, these sea peoples were causing chaos around the Mediterranean uh, until they encountered this guy, Ramses III of Egypt. Um, and Ramses was a big show off. So before he died, he created this giant temple that talked about all the amazing things he had done. And one of the things he bragged about was crushing these sea peoples. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a diagram of him uh, destroying sea peoples on the left. He ambushed them in the Nile River. Um, just to reiterate like how much he crushed them, um, here's, uh, here's exactly what he did to the sea people. <laughs> And then when he was done, he, you know, he grabbed the prisoners by the hair. Um, so he was really proud of, of destroying this, these sea peoples that were causing so much trouble for everybody in the Mediterranean. Um, but the thing about the sea peoples is that you know, they're mysterious, they're interesting, but we, we really don't know much about them. We don't know where they came from. We don't know who they were. We don't know what motivated them. And I think this story happens a lot in history. We have these things that we find, we discover pieces of, we don't know what they are or uh, what the story is. This is a battery that was found in, in Baghdad. Uh, it's like three, uh, yeah, about 2,000 years old. We, we don't know if it means that they discovered electricity. Uh, these are some mysterious lines in Peru. Um, we don't know why they were created, <laughs> what they were for. Um, some of you might be thinking this talk is going to become about aliens. It's not. <laughs> but the, the point here is um, we really don't know too much about our ancestors. Um, we see bits and pieces of them, but we really don't know too much about their stories or um, wh where they came from. So just to give an outline of where this talk is going, um, there's going to be some more ancient history. I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, you know, we're going back in time. Um, I'm going to talk some recent history about a project from 1945 called the Memex. Then I'm going to go over uh, my version of the Memex, uh, something that was inspired by this 1945 one, and then go back to the future. It was an unintentional phrase. We're going to talk about the future. Uh, so let's, let's talk about some ancient history again. Um, I'm going to give, give an overview of all the libraries that have survived um, from, from the Greek era, the ones that still survive. This is it. This is, this is the one library that survived uh, this era. It's, it's a bunch of uh, lava <laughs> that was covered the library. Um, in 79 CE, Pompeii exploded and covered, uh, uh, sorry, Mount Vesuvius exploded and covered Pompeii. Um, and in, in, this, uh, in this debris was this library that survived. Uh, and it didn't really survive. This is one of the scrolls in that library. It got turned into a burrito, uh, just carbonized uh, <laughs> instantly. Um, and archaeologists now spend a lot of time trying to like, read the letters that were on these scrolls with lasers. Um, but really, this is, this is almost the only library that survived from this, from this era. I'm going to now talk about all the manuscripts that survived from the Greek era. Uh, this, this is it. This is the single manuscript that we know of that survived from, that, that was originally uh, in ancient Greek. Um, it survived by someone throwing it into a fire, and it didn't burn completely. Um, so our track record of, of records from ancient civilizations is not too great. This is the famous, um, this is the famous library of Alexandria. Um, some of us might have heard about it. Um, it was a place that was built in Alexandria as, a, as like just a place where scholars could come and study this giant collection of uh, hundreds of thousands of manuscripts. Um, in 48 BCE, Julius Caesar burnt it, maybe accidentally, maybe intentionally. We don't really know, but we know that the library uh, suffered extreme damage. This is one of the scholars that worked out of the Library of Alexandria. Um, they called him the book forgetter because he wrote so many books uh, that he forgot all the books he wrote. So this was kind of a joke about him. Um, from different pieces of evidence, we know that he wrote about 4,000 books. Uh, we, we know the titles. We know some of the things he wrote about. Uh, the number of works that survived to now is zero. We, we literally don't have any books that survived from the book forgetter who wrote so many books. Um, and I think one of the, the messages uh, or lessons that I took away from studying this stuff is that uh, almost none of the Greek and Latin works survived in libraries. 
Um, they survived because scribes made copies of them, sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally. They survived in weird, kind of distributed ways. Um, and this is really the only reason we know about what these civilizations talked about. If we move beyond our Eurocentric vase, uh, gaze of, of uh, Greek and, and Latin history, uh, we look at China. This is the Yongle Emperor in the Ming Dynasty. Um, and as a political project and a, as, a, as a knowledge project, he determined to make this encyclopedia that represented all the knowledge that was in China at the time. Um, so he compiled every book he could find about uh, agricultural uh, history, literature, weird events, and he put it into this giant encyclopedia. It had 11,000 volumes, so like a, like a book-sized volume. It was giant. Um, it was actually the largest uh, encyclopedia until Wikipedia uh, w came around in 2007. Um, only one copy was, was ever written, and it disappeared. Uh, it might have been buried with the emperor. It might have burned in a fire. We don't know. There was another copy that was made that survived until the mid-16th century. Um, but bit by bit, volumes were lost. So some were burned, some were stolen by Europeans, some were just lost. And now we only have 400 volumes, so 3.5% survived of this giant encyclopedia. Um, the Mayan civilization it was beautiful, intricate, it had long history. Um, out, of, out of many, many works, uh, a total of four books from the whole civilization survived, uh, 200 pages. Uh, a lot of them were burned by Catholic priests um, who thought they were uh, witchcraft. This is Timbuktu in Mali, which was, uh, which was another uh, oasis for scholars. Like hundreds of scholars would come here and learn uh, from the giant manuscript collection. Um, over the course of hundreds of years, there were invasions. There was the chaos of the slave trade. Um, there was terrorism in, in rec in, as recently as uh, 10 years ago. And a lot of these manuscripts didn't survived. And the ones that did were survived because copies were made and they were stored in sort of these decentralized private collections. If you want to be even more depressed, you can go on Wikipedia and see all the list of libraries that were destroyed over the years. Um, so the track record is not, not too good for libraries over the long run. Um, and you know, the takeaway here is that most of humanity's records haven't survived things like war, terrorism, fires, um, colonization. And even the records that did survive, we don't have the voices of people that were colonized or women or people who weren't given the opportunity to record history. Um, but then the flip side of this is that sometimes knowledge uh, has survived in weird accidental ways. Um, and this really often happens if enough copies were made and spread around through, the, through a population and, and there was chances for these uh, individual copies to survive. So there's this essay that was pretty interesting that came out, I think, 10 years ago. It's called The Web of Alexandria by Bette Victor. Has anybody read it? No, nobody's read it. Okay, that's cool. Um, so he, he has a contrast. Um, he contrasts the way that the human genome survives uh, versus the way that the Library of Alexandria has survived. So in our, in our cells, each one of our cells has the full copy of the human genome. This is like, uh, and each one of us carries this, and like our, you know, the, the, the product of evolution has uh, put a copy in every single person, and, and collectively it survived um, all kinds of individual losses. Versus the Library of Alexandria, which we've already seen, has, has not survived uh, as a single point of failure. So he writes about the World Wide Web and the internet, um, and he says, we're, uh, we're, as a species, we're putting together a repository of knowledge and ideas unprecedented in scope and size. Uh, so which, which information uh, t technology should we model it on? Um, the one that's worked for four billion years, uh, or the one that's uh, responsible for the greatest intellectual tragedies in history? So this is a, a beautiful video of a glacier breaking apart. Um, it's, it's beautiful, it's terrifying, and I think over the last few months, a lot of us have come to this idea that, you know, perhaps, you know, we're, we're going to do everything we can, hopefully, but maybe we're not going to make it. Um, this is a book I read a few months ago. It wasn't particularly interesting. I don't know if I'd necessarily recommend it, but then on the last page, uh, <laughs> there was this pretty interesting quote. Um, as a, uh, as a biological and cultural diversity is threatened across the world by capitalist monoculture and mass extinction, we must build arcs. And why, why do we have to build arcs? Um, I think the argument here is that arcs will provide the, the seed stock for the future, for the survivors of, of climate change. Um, for those of you who didn't grow up in Sunday school every morning, uh, every Sunday, <laughs> the ark uh, was, was this uh, thing that Noah created uh, to, to save animals from climate change. Um, so all these animals went into the ark uh, and survived, and this is the reason we still have them. The problem is, as we've already seen, uh, centralized arcs are, are just very difficult to build properly. So this is the seed stock in, uh, in Norway, uh, where we've put um, all kinds of seeds, uh, just as a way to preserve them over the long run. Um, it was a really cool project, uh, supposed to survive for, for many years. Um, did anybody see this headline? <laughs> 
So basically, the permafrost melted too fast, and it flooded the entranceway of the C, C library. Um, and, they're, and they're doing all kinds of things now to fix this problem. But the point here is that uh, these arcs that we create, are, are, it's very difficult to have them survive over long periods of time. I think just these are some photos um, that Ingrid uh, Burrington found. Uh, she, she went and found um, AWS server farms. Um, and I, I just want you to imagine how these things might survive 100, 500 years. Will they survive electricity disruption? Will they survive uh, eco-terrorists who want to blow up all the servers? Uh, it's really hard to predict what will happen, but I think we can agree that this is probably not the best way to put our, our cultural heritage. So moving on to more recent history, I want to talk about a project from 1945 called the Memex. So this is the inventor of the Memex, Vannevar Bush, who was an engineer. Um, and he was operating at a time of, uh, where, where nuclear bombs had just come onto the scene and everybody was terrified. Uh, this is the first test, test bomb from 1945. Uh, and I think engineers and scientists were really worried about um, what would happen to humanity, what would happen to our, our cultural knowledge. Um, and for Vannevar Bush, he really wanted a way that, that humans could understand information better, complexity better, and um, you know, prevent these kind of uh, scenarios of nuclear destruction. So he put his engineering hat on after World War II, and he designed this device called the Memex. So what was the Memex? Um, it was a desk-sized device. Everybody would have them in their office. You'd put all your letters, your correspondence, your books, your records into this device. Uh, and then you would be able to store, uh, store everything, search through it, make notes. Um, this is a cool add-on device where you could uh, write, use a stylus to add notes into your Memex. This is a voice recorder, so you could add uh, you know, audio messages into your Memex. This is a cool clip-on camera where you can add photos from, from your every day into, into the Memex. Um, but his, his thesis was that as, as technology was creating a way to store records in smaller and smaller ways, we could put all the libraries and encyclopedias of the world into this desk-sized device, um, and there they would be useful for people. They could be amplified by your notes, by your, uh, by your own records. Um, so really, the vision of the Memex was a, a, um, a collection of, of different things. First of all, it was a local replica of the world's libraries. Then it would be combined with user data, so your notes and your, your own interactions with a, a subject. And then it would be all stored in this desk-sized device. So it's a really cool idea. Unfortunately, it was never built. It was a conceptual device. It was written about in two essays, and then Vannevar Bush got busy with other things. So it was never built. Um, <laughs> I thought it was really cool when I found out about it. And uh, you know, I, wanted, I wanted a Memex. It wasn't, it wasn't around for me to use. So I decided to build my own. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've built. Um, so, so my version of the Memex is, is pretty similar. It's a digital repository, but it's a repository of everything I've seen, everything I've read, everything I've done, the places I've traveled, the photographs I've taken. And it's all stored locally, so I have a copy of all this information on my own device. So just quickly, I'm going to do a, a brief demo um, of what I've built. Um, Cool. Okay, so this is just uh, the main screen. Um, what we have here is just a way to query stuff, and these are results from my personal history. So what we have on the screen is all the things I've liked across different services. So if I favored a tweet, it's, it's in there. Um, if I've saved a bookmark, it's in there. Um, I can do things like scope it down to a different provider. So this is now everything I've liked on YouTube. Um, so I, can, I have a full record of, of everything I've seen on YouTube or liked on YouTube. Um, and just to give a sense of like the long history, I have stuff from uh, 2006 onwards in, in this Memex, copied and saved. Um, I can do other things like uh, the places I've traveled. So this is all the bike rides I've done in um, Amsterdam, for example. Oh, that's not how you spell Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Um, and I can, I can map it out. So it has a, has a really nice record of like all the places I've been. Um, I do some manual tracking. So this is uh, what I've eaten. Uh, so this is all the burritos I've eaten in Toronto. Uh, uh, you know, and I can make a heat map of all the places I've had burritos in Toronto. <laughs> but I think a little bit more seriously, let's have a look at something like this. So this is everything in my system um, where I've interacted with the, te with the topic of climate change. Climate change. Um, so it's searching across all the records and all the things I've done. Um, so here's a to-do that was related to my talk. This is some browser history of, of an article I read about the seed bank. This is the podcast. This is some email. So I have like a complete record of everything I've seen related to this topic. And it just gives you, I guess, a sense of like the different types of records. Again, I can graph it out. Like I have records back to 2005 on this topic. Um, and then again, just to give an idea of what kind of stuff is in this uh, was in this session. Um, so these are like messages that involve climate change. Um, 
So this is like an email, this is a Slack message, this is some iMessage. Um, I have, uh, I can do something else like this. This is pho photographs. So what, I have a copy of every photograph I've taken. Um, and what's happening here is I have OCR going on my photo. So um, somewhere in this, in this image is the word climate change, which is matched. Um, and then because I have so much different types of personal information, I can use it to navigate in different ways. So if I remember that I took a, a, a photograph of climate change and I was with my partner, I can add it um, occurred uh, with, um, and then my partner's name is Michael. So now this is every photograph about climate change I've taken, uh, I've taken with Michael. I'm not sure. Occurred. Oh yeah, it worked, okay. So um, these are the two photos I've taken with climate change that I took with my partner. Um, and then for each one of them, I can see the context, um, where I was and what I was doing. Um, I don't know why it's a bit slow. Yeah, so I was, I was in Rome, I was with my partner. Uh, and then I can go back and see like, what else I was doing around the same time I took this photo. So I was, I was looking up stuff in the museum, I was writing notes. So I have this complete record of like, what I've done and, um, and it's all copied safely in this personal database system. Um, and then I can do all kinds of other things. I can take notes, I can organize this data, I can make dashboards. This is like a dashboard of like, my cycling history. Um, so I can do all kinds of things with this copy of, of personal data that I've managed to put into my memex. Um, so that's, that's the end of the demo. Um, I have more on my website if you want to have a look. Um, this, this talk is sort of about the memex, but it's also, I guess, in a broader climate of, of climate change. So <laughs> I want to start talking about that again. Um, thanks for watching the demo. So I think my, my goal here is, uh, you know, this is a three-step process. I want to provide the system, this memex system, I want to open source it and let people use it and get a whole bunch of people using it. Um, step two, I, I don't know what will happen. Uh, step three, profit. And I think by profit, I mean survive. <laughs> and I hope for you know, a whole, you know, a bunch of people to install this Memex system, uh, maybe solar powered versions, maybe mesh networked, maybe stone etched. I don't really know, but I, I, I want there to be a diversity of people, uh, diversity of, of techniques being used with, the, with this system. And maybe collectively, some of these will survive the climate apocalypse. So in the best case, uh, this open source project, uh, you know, we managed to stabilize climate change and we, as a species, survive. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's cool because the Memex will give users a, a pretty interesting uh, tool to use to interact with their own history. In the worst case, if we don't survive this climate apocalypse, uh, <laughs> maybe one of these Memexes will survive in a weird way, weird surprising way, and we'll get this, this log, this history of, of, a, of a person uh, and what they were experiencing and the copies of information they saw. So if you're interested in trying out this uh, system when it's ready, uh, send me an email, sign up for my newsletter. Um, I'm going to move on. This slide will be at the end, so you don't have to worry about it right now. I want to just conclude again with um, the C peoples. Go back to these C peoples. Um, if you weren't listening or came late, the C peoples were these, uh, these peoples that went around the Mediterranean, sacking cities and destroying peoples um, until they came, uh, encountered Ramses and were uh, you know, stopped in their tracks. But around the same time as the C people, something else was happening. Uh, this, is, this is Iceland, Mount Hecla. They call it the gateway to hell. Um, <laughs> it's a big, scary volcano. Um, this is an eruption in 1980, so you can get a sense of the volcanic ash that is unleashed by Mount Hecla. So about 2,500 years ago, there was this eruption of Mount Hecla that we have records of. And one by one, we have records of civilizations collapsing across this time. And you can see that some of the civilizations that collapsed weren't anywhere near the Mediterranean. So this couldn't be the sea people sacking them. Something else was going on. And historians now feel that there was a, there was a, a, a 20, 30 year drought that was happening because of this volcano. And crops were failing, the climate changed, there was desertification happening. Um, this is a record that we have from one of the kings, uh, or sort of the queens of, uh, of civilization. And she writes that she has no grain in the land and it's a, it's a cry of desperation to our neighbors to help her out. Um, and I think we see a lot of civilizations that just, uh, they didn't survive this, this long period of drought. And what historians are now thinking might have happened is that these, um, if we go back to the Sea Peoples, this is a diagram of, of them being crushed by Ramses. It's really the only depiction that we have. So we're trying to, we're, we're extrapolating a little bit from this depiction. But if you look carefully, um, you can see that this is, a, this is an ox, uh, an ox cart. And this is probably not a war ox, because ox are, are not really the best, uh, you know, they're not a war elephant. Um, again, here's another depiction of a war ox. And historians have good reason to believe that there might be women and, and children depicted on, on, on these uh, oxen. And it's leading to this conclusion, um, what if the Sea Peoples were these early climate change refugees? Uh, their civilizations had collapsed, um, they had no homelands, they had no grains, and they just in desperation took to the seas, um, trying to find a new ho homeland. 
So the questions I started with are you know, really basic, but they were, who are they? Where did they come from? What happened to them? We don't really know the answer. We can kind of guess. This is one speculation. But I think like, I, I look at this, and I wonder so much more like, that we will never be able to answer. Like, um, when did these people know that it was time to leave their homelands? Like, what were they afraid of? What was going through their mind when they left their homelands? Um, what were they scared of? What were they proudest of creating? Like, what were they taking with them that they were proud of um, meant a lot to them? Um, we'll never know these answers to these questions. We'll never have the lessons that they um, might have learned. We'll never have their wisdom. And I think like, it's, it's maybe a sober question, but can we leave the survivors of the climate change catastrophe with more than the sea people left us? Um, so I'd like to take questions now if we have time. Uh, we have time, yeah, okay. And I have a link there if you wanna sign up for uh, my newsletter and get alerted to when, when this project is gonna be ready to use. So speaking as someone who's trained as an archaeologist, I have some concerns. Sorry. Yeah. Um, speaking as an archaeologist, I have some concerns. Um, first, uh, well, some of them are very broad, and uh, I can't really cover them all in this question. Um, but more specifically, um, I have concerns about the way that ancient history is being represented as a product comprising a collection of facts rather than as a form of uh, situated memory, which is inherently spotty or fragmentary and prioritizes the archaeologists or the memory maker's uh, own perspectives. So I'm wondering how uh, records are, how in your memex or in, your, uh, in, in how your, your imagined future memex, yeah. how records are, uh, how the intention of records and the, um, the, the, the reason why they're curated or curated in such a way is uh, is uh, um, made part of the system that you're that you're implementing, mm -hmm. um, and like how are these situated purposes or experiences underlie the records being presented or represented? In short, yeah, I mean, like just to address the broader question, like obviously, like this is. Uh, you know, it's kind of a sketch of, of history, and it's, it's like, I think really the thesis here is that like, information survives in, in weird, unpredictable ways. Um, it's not really an academic take, I understand that. And I think my project is not an academic one in terms of like, trying to situate knowledge in complicated ways. I think what I'm trying to do is create like, one, one possible um, record of my own history, um, launch it in the world, see, see how people take it up, and collectively one of these might survive. And it, like, I think I'm not too interested in like, the nuances of what I'm capturing, I'm capturing everything. Um, and I'm not, I, I don't really know what will happen to it. Um, I, it's just kind of an experimental project and I'm just curious to see what happens. Yeah, and like, like it is definitely, like I think it's, it's, it's records that are being stored of myself that are from the perspective of myself. It's things I've seen. And I'm not really curating it in the sense, like it is capturing everything. It's everything I've said, everything I've read, um, everything I've interacted with. Um, so it, it is like kind of like the view of a single person through through um, through through like my eyes. Yeah, like I I, I know there's like deep nuances around like um, I guess like how how information is stored and like I think this this project doesn't really get into that. It is really like a tool that I'm building for myself just to just to have something powerful for myself, with the intention of maybe it surviving in in, in an interesting way. Yeah. Hey. Uh Oh, on the software side, what do you do to survive that you drop your laptop on the floor and the database is can? Yeah, I mean, so I, I talk about it living on the device. Like, it is not actually living on the device. It's living on a digital ocean node that I, that I host. I mean, so right. I, I mean, I haven't actually implemented a long-term survival strategy for this project. Uh, I've worked on the interface. I've worked on the data collection. I think I will now, at some point, start working on like you know rugged, ruggedizing it for the <laughs> for long term. What's that? Yeah, sure, yeah, but like I think this is a life. This is a lifetime project. I hope to continue to work on it over my lifetime. And like you know, it's a lot of it is speculative. I, I don't really know where it's going to go. I just know that this is a direction I have to take it in. So, yeah. Okay. Hi, um, you've been doing this for a long time, and I'm kind of interested in up the personal level, like. What are the most interesting things you've discovered about yourself by collecting this data? How has it changed your experiences of being in the world to know that this information about you is being collected? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, I, th I think a lot of my friends know. Like, I, like, 
almost everything I'm doing is being recorded in some ways. And <laughs> like when, they're ch when we're chatting, you know, like these, these things are being recorded. We have different ways of, of indicating whether I shouldn't record something. <laughs> uh, so like I think this, like, I think for me, the, the knowledge that this is like a completely personal anti-social app uh, really changes the relationship with it. It's like having a journal. Like a lot of us are comfortable with sharing secrets in a journal because we know that nobody will ever see this. And I think that's like the most important thing about this project. Like there's no sharing built in. There's no social networking built in. Um, because I'm a tech technological person, I feel pretty confident that I built the security right. Uh, I'm not really too worried about people seeing um, these records. So I think that's, that's the number one thing. And then in terms of how it uh, changes my relationship with like the present and the way I interact with the present, um, I think it's, it's very similar to a journal, like a lot of us journal. Um, I, I think um, it's, it's, a way of, uh, it's a way of being in the moment uh, and, and almost like confronting how you feel uh, and then committing it to records. Like a lot of us do that through journaling. I'm doing it through this, this process. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot more I can say about it, but I think I think the journal like is the best metaphor I can think of for this. It's like a it's like a more encompassing journal with maybe a little bit less curation. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I just had a question about will it pull a local archive? Like when MySpace went down and it kind of wiped out a decade of people's art and music. Yeah. Will this be able to create a local copy in the Memex so that? If these websites go down in the future, you'll still have a copy of everything. Yeah, totally. That's a great question. So, um, like you know, all the time, like oh, I've been working on this project on and off for for years. I've seen a lot of services disappear over that time. Um, one example is Vine.com. Like you know, I, I I managed to pull an, a copy of all my Vine uh, content, <laughs> and so it's in the Memex. I can go go browse and see like my Vine content from when did it shut down? 2015. Um, so yeah, like I think a big a big part of this project is archiving material that I suspect will not survive over a long period of time, um, and it's tricky. A lot of it has to do with like building scrapers or using the API in ways that you aren't supposed to. But like I think it's important to try to capture everything I've done just just to make this project like kind of the extreme version I, I want it to be. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll cool. go here. Yeah, the mic. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so from. The initial, like how you how you be began your presentation, um, you clearly built something that is meant to be found by somebody sometime, right? How do you how does your project embed the notion of nobody can read this while I'm alive? To it's a time capsule that opens itself at some point to whoever finds it. Is that something that is yeah. embedded in your yeah, totally. So th there's a tension, obviously, between security, private, like a, a, pr security and privacy versus this time capsule surviving for, for a long period of time. I haven't resolved this tension. I actually haven't built any of the time capsule features. I don't really even have a conception of how I'm going to do this. Um, and I, I think. I think in terms of like me leaving my data for other people, I, th I think I can stomach that. But there's a lot of stuff where people have gossiped to me and these records are in there. There's stuff that involves other people that's in there. And I think there's a consent issue and a privacy issue where it's not just about my records that will be um, revealed. It's, it's about other people. And I'm, I'm really careful about that. So I haven't, like the answer is I haven't figured that out yet. Um, it might just come down to marking certain categories of things as, as, I guess, releasable in the long term. But I still haven't figured out a way if I accidentally die to, I don't know, to reveal the encryption keys. But I think encryption keys, like that's, that's something that probably will not survive 100, 500 years. So again, like I don't, I don't really know the solution to that. Um, and I think by releasing this project as an open source project where a lot of people do it, I, I hope that collectively some of us will figure it out ways that this will survive in interesting ways. And like, I think that's my takeaway from, from history. It's like a single person can't create a library that will survive a long period of time. But if enough copies are made, and spread around in a decentralized way, some of these will survive. <laughs> so it's, it's a hunch that this might happen. I don't know how it'll happen, but I hope it'll happen. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you've been doing this for maybe three years now. Uh, how large is your uh, DigitalOcean uh, droplet at this point? Uh, it's hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of gigs. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm keeping a copy of photos and videos and stuff like that, right? Yeah. The, the text part of it, like, so, like, the emails and messages and, like, the text part of it is, I think it's about 20 gigs of text. Yeah. And I can search across all of that, which is really powerful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? I think um, we'll call it there. And cool. so thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Can we uh, thank Andrew for his talk?